There's a medical revolution that's happening all around us, and it's one that's going to help us conquer some of society's most dreaded conditions, including cancer. The revolution is called angiogenesis, and it's based on our body's ability to grow blood vessels. So why should we care about blood vessels? Well, the human body is literally packed with them, 60,000 miles in a typical adult. So lined up end to end, they would actually form a line that could circle the Earth twice. The smallest blood vessels are called capillaries. We've got 19 billion of them in our bodies. These are the vessels of life, and as I'll show you, they can also be the vessels of death. One remarkable thing about blood vessels is their ability to adapt to whatever environment they're in. So for example, in the liver, they form channels to detoxify blood. In lungs, they line air sacs for gas exchange. In muscles, they corkscrew to allow muscles to contract without cutting off circulation. And in nerves, they course like power cables, keeping those nerves alive. And we get all these blood vessels when we're actually still in the womb. And what this means is that, as adults, blood vessels don't normally grow, except in a few special circumstances. In women, blood vessels grow every month to build the lining of the uterus. During pregnancy, they form the connection between mom and baby, the placenta. And during wound healing, after injury, they grow underneath the scab to help heal the wound. And here they are, hundreds of blood vessels growing towards the center of the wound to help heal it. Now the body has the ability to balance and to regulate the amount of blood vessels present at any given time. So as a lot of things in life, it's really all about balance. And it does this through an elaborate and elegant system of checks and balances, inhibitors and stimulators, such that when we need to grow a burst brief of, of blood vessels, the body does this by releasing stimulators, proteins called angiogenic factors. These are natural fertilizers that help to stimulate new blood vessels to sprout. And when those excess vessels are no longer needed, the body can prune them back using natural inhibitors. Now, there are other situations in which we start out beneath the baseline, and we need to grow new vessels to get to normal, for example, after injury. And the body can do that too, but only to that normal set point, to that baseline. Now, what we do know is that there are a number of diseases in which there are defects in the system. The body's unable to prune back extra vessels or unable to grow enough new ones in the right time at the right place. And in all these situations, angiogenesis is out of balance. And when angiogenesis is out of balance, a multitude of diseases results. For example, insufficient blood vessels, not enough leads to wounds that don't heal, heart disease, limbs without circulation, death from stroke, nerve damage. On the other hand, excessive angiogenesis, too many blood vessels, drives diseases. And we see that in cancer, blindness, arthritis, obesity, Alzheimer's. In total, more than 70 major diseases affecting one billion people worldwide all look on the surface to be different from one another but all share abnormal angiogenesis as their common denominator. And this realization is leading us to reconceptualize how we approach the treatment of these diseases by controlling angiogenesis. I'm going to focus on cancer because angiogenesis is the hallmark of cancer, every type of cancer. So here we go. This is a tumor, dark, gray, ominous, growing in a brain. And under the microscope, you can see hundreds of brown staining blood vessels feeding the cancer cells, bringing oxygen and nutrients. But cancers don't start out this way. Cancers start out without their own blood supply as small nests of cells that grow, but only to the size of one half of a cubic millimeter. That's the tip of a ballpoint pen. Then they can't grow any further because without a blood supply, they don't have enough oxygen or nutrients. In fact, we're probably forming microscopic cancers all the time. Autopsy studies of people who've died in car accidents have shown that about 40% of women between the ages of 40 and 50 already have microscopic cancers in their breast. 
about 50% of men in their 50s and 60s have microscopic prostate cancer. And virtually 100% of us, by the time we reach our 70s, will have microscopic cancers growing in our thyroid. Yet without a blood supply, most of these cancers won't become dangerous. Dr. Judah Folkman, who was my mentor and also a pioneer of the angiogenesis field, once called this cancer without disease. So the body's ability to control and balance angiogenesis when it's working properly prevents blood vessels from feeding cancer. And it turns out that this is one of our most important, important defense mechanisms against cancer. In fact, if you block angiogenesis and keep blood vessels from ever getting to cancer cells, tumors simply can't grow up. But once angiogenesis occurs, those tumors can grow and expand exponentially. So here's how you go from being a harmless to a deadly cancer. Cancer cells mutate, they gain the ability to release androgenic factors, and that tips the balance to allow blood vessels to invade the cancer, then the cancers can expand and grow, invade local tissues, and in fact, those same vessels that are feeding cancers now allows for the cancer cells to exit into the circulation and spread as metastases. Unfortunately, this late stage is the one at which most cancers are diagnosed after angiogenesis has already turned on and cancer cells are growing like wild. Now, if angiogenesis is the tipping point between a harmless and a harmful cancer, then one major part of the angiogenesis revolution is a new approach to treating cancers by cutting off their blood supply. We call this anti-angiogenic therapy. And it's completely different from chemotherapy because it selectively aims at the vessels that feed cancers. We can do this because tumor blood vessels are very different from the blood vessels in other parts of the body. They're abnormal, they're very poorly constructed, and because of that, they're vulnerable to therapies that target them. In effect, when we give a patient anti-angiogenic therapy, like this experimental drug for a glioma in the brain, you can see dramatic effects when the cancer is being starved. This is a woman with breast cancer who's given the drug Avastin, an anti-androgenic drug. And you can see that halo of blood flow disappears after treatment. So I've just shown you two different cancer types, both of which responded to anti-androgenic therapy. And we, we, a few years ago, we said, could we take this one step further and treat other species, treat other cancers? This is a nine-year-old boxer named Milo. He's got an aggressive cancer growing in his shoulder called a malignant neurofibroma. It's already invaded into his lungs. His veterinarian gave him three months to live. So we created an anti-angiogenic cocktail of drugs that could be mixed into his dog food and also a cream that could be applied over the tumor. Within a few weeks, we saw that we could slow the tumor growth down, and ultimately, we were able to extend Milo's life by six times what the veterinarian had predicted, all with good quality of life. Since then, we've treated over 600 dogs. We've achieved about a 60% response rate and improved survival for many of these pets that were about to be euthanized. Let me show you a few other interesting cases. This is a dolphin in Florida who developed lesions in her mouth that became invasive squamous cell cancers. So we created an anti-androgenic paste and had it painted on these sites three times a week. And over the course of seven months, the lesions disappeared and the biopsies came back normal. Here is a tumor growing on the lip of a quarter horse named Guinness. It's a very, very deadly type of cancer called an angiosarcoma. So we used our anti-androgenic skin cream, applied it to the lips, and also added an oral cocktail. And six months later, he had a complete remission. So here he is six years later, Guinness with his happy owner. So I asked, could we take the same approach and treat human patients 
like this invasive squamous cell cancer growing on the forearm of a woman from Florida. And with topical anti-androgenic therapy alone, the cancer starved of its blood supply melted away after 12 weeks. 94% of patients in our study achieved the same results without any surgery whatsoever. And we've treated hundreds of patients since then who've been unable to tolerate conventional surgery. So clearly, anti-androgenesis therapies can work in a wide variety of cancers. And in fact, the first pioneering treatments are already becoming available. 13 different drugs, 14 different cancer types. But the question is, how well do these work in practice? This is patient survival data from eight different cancer types. And the bars represent survival times in the era when only chemotherapy or radiation or surgery were available. But since 2004, when anti-angiogenic therapy became available, there's been a 70 to 100% improvement in survival for kidney cancer, multiple myeloma, colorectal, and gastrointestinal stromal cancers. That's impressive. But for some other cancer types, the improvements have only been modest. So I asked myself, why haven't we been able to do better? And the answer to me is simple. We're treating cancer too late in the game after they've already become established and oftentimes have already spread and metastasized. And as a doctor, I know that once a disease progresses to an advanced stage, achieving a cure can be difficult, if not impossible. So we went back to the biology of angiogenesis, and we started thinking, could the answer to cancer be preventing angiogenesis, beating cancer at its own game, so that cancers could never become dangerous? And in order to look for a way of preventing cancers, we went back to cancer's causes. And I was really intrigued to find that diet accounts for 30 to 35% of all environmentally caused cancers. So the obvious thing to think would be, well, what can we strip out and eliminate from the diet? But we took the exact opposite point of view, and we asked, what can we add to the diet that's naturally anti-androgenic, that could boost the body's natural defense systems and beat back those cancer, the vessels that are feeding cancers. In other words, can we eat to starve cancer? And the answer is yes, and I'm going to show you how. Our search has taken us to the market, to the farm, to the spice cabinet. Because what we've discovered is that Mother Nature has laced a large number of foods, beverages, and herbs with naturally occurring inhibitors of angiogenesis. This is a test that we developed for angiogenesis. In the center, you can see a ring, and there are hundreds of blood vessels to grow out in a starburst pattern. We can use the system then to test for dietary factors at concentrations attainable by eating. Here's what we found when we tested red grapes. The active ingredient is resveratrol. It's also present in red wine. You can see that it inhibits angiogenesis by 60%. This is what happens when we added an extract from strawberries. It potently inhibits androgenesis. An extract from soybeans. And here is our growing list of anti-androgenic foods and beverages that we're interested in studying. And for each of these foods, we believe that there are different potencies within different strains and varieties. And we want to measure this because, well, while you're eating an apple or drinking tea, why not select the most potent one for cancer prevention? Let me just show you some of our research with green tea. Here are four of the teas we tested. They're all common ones. Chinese jasmine, Japanese sencha, Earl Grey, and a special blend we prepared. You'll see that they all vary in their potency from less potent at the bottom, more potent at top. Now what's really cool is that when we combined the two less potent teas, the combination, the blend, was actually more potent than either one alone. 
This means that there's food synergy. Here's some more data from our testing. In the lab, we can simulate tumor angiogenesis as represented by this black bar. Using the system, we can then test the potency of cancer drugs. So the shorter the bar, the less angiogenesis. That's good. Here are some drugs, common ones, that have been associated with reducing the risk of cancer in people. Statins, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and a few others. They also inhibit androgenesis. And here are dietary factors going head to head against those drugs. You can see that they clearly hold their own. And in fact, some of them are even more potent than the drugs. So parsley, soy, garlic, grapes, berries. You can eat well with these ingredients. So imagine if we could create the world's first rating system in which we could score foods for their anti-angiogenic cancer preventative properties. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. Now, I've just shown you a whole bunch of lab data. But the real question is, what is the evidence in people that eating certain foods can reduce androgenesis in cancer? Well, the best example I know of is from this study of 79,000 men followed over 20 years, in which it was found that men who consumed two to three servings of cooked tomatoes per week had up to a 50% reduction in the risk of developing prostate cancer. We know that tomatoes are a great source of lycopene. And lycopene is anti-angiogenic. In fact, in the men who did develop prostate cancer, those who ate more tomato sauce actually had fewer vessels feeding their cancers. So this human study is a prime example of how anti-angiogenic substances present in food and taken at practical levels can impact on cancer. These are the most common cancers worldwide. In blue, the number of new cases. In red, deaths from those cancers every single year. And for each of these cancer types, we're generating the evidence for the specific foods that can reduce their cancer risk, along with the data of how much you need to eat. So tomatoes is up there, as are beets, cauliflower, sweet potatoes, sardines, cloudy apple juice, even how to cheese. And we realize that we're sitting on a lot of data that could benefit from people. So we've compiled this into a system and developed a program called the Eat to Defeat Cancer Initiative. It's available at eattodefeat.org. And through the system, we're gathering insights into how to optimize the cancer preventative activity of foods as part of everyday meals. For example, what do you think the best way is of eating a tomato? Fresh and raw or cooked? Well, the amount of anti-angiogenic lycopene actually goes up 50% after a quick saute for two minutes. And it goes up even further if you simmer for at least 15 minutes. And that's in the tomato itself. So what happens when we consume that cooked tomato? Well, the lycopene goes up in the blood. But get this, if you cook that tomato in olive oil, the absorption goes up 2.3 times. Let me just share with you some other examples of how data can be turned into practical use. So everyone's got their own favorite apples, but which of these do you think might be the most potent for cancer prevention? Well, we're finding that different varieties have different amounts of flavanols, and flavanols are anti-androgenic. Cruciferous vegetables, like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, contain anti-androgenic cancer-preventative molecules called glucosinolates and isothiocyanates. So here's a question. What's the best way of cooking these vegetables? Well, it turns out that stir-frying or steaming preserves those molecules, 
but boiling can degrade them up to 77%. So one last example. How long do you steep your tea for? Where do you fall on this curve? Well, catechins, sometimes known as EGCG, are anti-androgenic cancer-preventative molecules in people. And it turns out that the longer you steep your tea, the more catechins get extracted into the beverage that you're drinking. And in fact, if you dunk your tea bag, the extraction is better at every single time point. <laughs> because that dunking action increases the surface area of tea leaves exposed to the hot water. Now, what I've just shown you has far-reaching implications, far beyond cancer research. Because if we're right, it could impact on consumer education, food services, public health, even the insurance industry. And in fact, some insurance companies are already beginning to think along these lines because they know that cancer prevention can ultimately save the money in healthcare costs. Check out this ad from one of the largest insurance carriers in the United States. And for most people in the world, dietary cancer prevention may be the only practical solution because not everybody can afford expensive end-stage cancer treatments. But everybody could benefit from a healthy diet of local, sustainable, anti-androgenic crops. Now, the good news is that while cancer specialists aren't yet touting the benefits of food, actually, most of them do believe it. This is from our survey of oncologists in the United States. And from our research of healthy individuals, our data, based on evidence, is the type of information that they're looking for. And they say that they're willing and open to change their eating habits. In fact, the Eat to Defeat Cancer approach of adding rather than eliminating foods resonates with their preferences. So with 5,000 people and growing in our Eat to Defeat community worldwide, I recently calculated that through social networking and word of mouth, that they've spread the word to over 73,000 people. And through multimedia channels, almost 13 million people have now been exposed to this information. Truly, that's the power of thinking digital. Now, I've been speaking to you about cancer, but I've also been speaking to you about food. So there's just one more disease that I have to show you, and that's obesity. It turns out that adipose tissue, or fat, is highly angiogenesis dependent. Like a tumor, fat grows when blood vessels grow. So the question is, can we shrink fat by cutting off its blood supply? This top curve is the weight of a genetically obese mouse. It keeps eating on and on until it gets big, fat, and furry like a tennis ball. Now the bottom curve is the weight of a normal mouse. If you give the obese mouse an anti-androgenic therapy, it loses its weight. When you stop the therapy, it gains its weight back. Give the therapy again, and the weight goes down. And you can cycle its weight up and down just by giving an angiogenesis inhibitor. So our approach to cancer prevention may also find application to obesity. Now what's truly interesting is that you can't make that obese mouse lose more weight than what the weight of a normal mouse should be. In other words, we can't make supermodel mice. <laughs> and this speaks to the role of angiogenesis in regulating healthy tissues. Albers and Yorgi said that cons discovery consists of seeing what everyone has seen and thinking what no one has thought. I hope I've convinced you that when it comes to cancer, obesity, and other conditions, that there may be great power in attacking their common denominator, angiogenesis. Thank you very much. That was amazing. That was really, really good. Uh, just, just, just one question before you go. Uh, first of all, thanks for such a powerful presentation. I mean, talk about news you can use. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> 
Um, I, I, so one thing is, uh, just on some of the practical things, uh, you talked about sort of two to three cooked tomatoes for prostate cancer uh, or helping to prevent prostate cancer. Why not say 20 to 30? Is, does it, is, there, is there a sort of, does it tail off on the other side if, once you get beyond a certain critical number? Well, well we don't know that yet. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that our approach is really about what are things that are practical to do because it's not just about things to um, change the way we, we, we live. Mm. It's got to be things that we like to do. Mm. So it's got to be tasty and mm. something we can actually incorporate into our own lives. Mm. So two to three cooked tomatoes a week mm. is good. Mm. Maybe more is better, but there's just probably a certain limit. Yeah, Moderation sure. is probably sure. key. And what about uh, a, a, like a lycopene pill or a resveratrol pill? Does it, does it depend on the food? Is there something beyond just simply the chemical? So that's a very interesting issue. And there have been studies shown comparing tomatoes given to experimental animals versus lycopene as a pure form. Mm. And it turns out that even though you can give lycopene at 10 times the level of what's found in the tomato extract, mm. the tomato extract will beat the cancer prevention and cancer inhib the inhibition of angiogenesis and the reduction of cancer growth every single time. Mm. So there's probably a number of things in foods, including tomatoes, more than lycopene, mm. that are helping to, as I've shown, the food synergy. Mm. There are probably many things that are helping to benefit uh, as we eat foods. And so part of our approach is really about food as a whole uh, entity rather than individual chemical supplements. Mm. And uh, we, we also said there are interactions. Like clearly things like olive oil seem to act as a sort of delivery agent or some substrate to bring that stuff into the body more quickly than otherwise well. So what, where is your research going next? Because obviously, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it seems like there's still a number of questions and challenges, no doubt. So I'm wondering, where are you guys headed? Well, our feeling is that it's all about data and evidence. And what we like to do is put a number on every type of food, every strain, every variety, mm -hmm. and figure out exactly when you process and you cook, you freeze, you extract, what happens to that number? That number is almost a comparative effectiveness, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, between different foods. And you can imagine that at some point this is something that consumers can have uh, access to. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would like to work with governments mm -hmm. and industry to have that as a label on foods to give people the sense about what should I, tr what should I select mm. in the grocery store. Uh, you can also imagine that that might allow us to combine foods in unique ways, mm. uh, product foods in different ways. And one of the things we're doing now is we're working with chefs to find a way of um, developing tasty and healthy recipes mm. that utilize the most optimum antiangenic ingredients. On obesity, sorry, on obesity, uh, would, would, would anti-angiogenic therapy help defeat that regardless of what you ate. So if you only ate cotton candy, or candy floss as they call it here, uh, would, uh, in, would, the, would, would therapy like that still defeat that, or is, it, is, that, is that still, is that tough to say? We don't know that yet, but okay. we'll, 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 we're taking, uh, taking people who want to volunteer for that study. <laughs> <laughs> what, one of the things that we're, we're doing actually is, you know, in parallel to these studies, we, we actually want to try to get this word out, to unroll this, and this is why uh, we think that there's true power in social networking. Um, you know, these are, this is the kind of information that people can use right now. It's all about prevention. It's thing that you do as part of everyday life. And we're trying to find better ways of having interactivity with consumers. Ultimately, this is about what we can all do as people, as users, as consumers, rather than what you have to go to a doctor for and get a prescription. And so if there's ways that we can scale this up very quickly, using digital technology, that's what we're really hoping for. And have you found yourself being uninvited to pharmaceutical conferences now? Because it seems there are some <laughs> companies that must be scared about some of the data you're showing up. Well, they're, 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 they may be, um, they may be uh, uh, intimidated, but they're also very interested. Okay. And I think that uh, you know, everything that we're doing here really goes and piggybacks on top of the you know, several decades of research that went into all the drugs that I showed you earlier. Okay. So this is a very exciting field, and we're just at the, at the, at the tip of it. So the list of foods, well, we found that at eattodefeat.org. Yes. Okay, and your, your uh, foundation is just angio.org, right? The foundation is angio.org, okay. and the initiative is eattodefeat.org. Great. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Cheers. Thank you.